Hello, my name is Ashley. Welcome to day two of our Peace and Justice event. Before we get started, I would like to take a few minutes to acknowledge the lives we've lost to gun violence every day. On average, 100 people, 100 people are killed by guns in America daily, and even more are shot and injured. We are hoping that this two-day event will bring us closer to finding solutions that have lasting impacts on those who are affected by gun violence. And as we think about the lives we have lost, I would like to ask if all of us could take a 30 second moment of silence. Thank you. Um, hello, I, I'm Jasper. I use he, him, and they, them pronouns. And um, welcome to a conversation about policing in America. We have, today we have three um, panelists with us to talk about and answer some questions about different ways law enforcement plays a role in gun violence and general public safety within that realm. Um, we have some prepared questions which were sent out beforehand to the panelists. And um, now, if you three would like to do quick one minute inter introductions, you can feel free to do that now. And just kind of give like introduction to yourself and as well as a background on what you do. Hi, uh, I am Cami Chavis. I am a professor at the Wake Forest uh, University School of Law. I'm also a special advisor to the Coalition to Stop Gun Violence and Educational Fund Stop Gun Violence. And um, I have I was a former prosecutor, so I'm really aware of the goal of the toll that gun violence has taken on many communities. Um, and now I work a lot on criminal justice reform. And, um, and police reform. All right, I'm Alex Williams, um, the neighborhood safety coordinator uh, with Safe and Sound. I'm serving in the District 5 area, so that's the Amani and Harambe neighborhoods in Milwaukee. Um, most of my background is actually in education, uh, youth development, and um, working with families and communities. Um, I took this role to try to improve um, community police relations in my neighborhood and make that uh, learning a two-way conversation. Um, and I guess one of the philosophies I live by is if, if not me, then who? If we don't have somebody who's from our Milwaukee neighborhoods working directly with law enforcement to be the voice of the community, then who is doing that for us? So that's why I'm here. Hello, everyone. My name is Tatiana. Um, I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am a policy associate with March for Our Lives, um, but I've been doing gun violence prevention work for a while now. Actually, I was a WAVE intern, so shout out to all you interns that put together this amazing event. It's so cool and to just see how far this internship program has gone. It's really cool to see, so I'm just excited to be here. Um, I'm from Milwaukee, so just seeing gun violence, you know, in our community every single day is really why I got involved, but also um, I lost my aunt in 2017 in a um, murder suicide at the hands of her husband, who actually was a Milwaukee police officer. So excited for this conversation. Thank you. Um, welcome, we're very happy to have you here. Uh, so we're gonna get started with some of the questions we have and the first one, um, what do you believe are some of the leading causes of gun violence? So if anyone would like to go first, feel free. Uh, yeah, I can start. Um, I honestly think the biggest root cause of gun violence is 
poverty. Um, I genuinely believe that, you know, every single shooting is a policy failure. Um, when we think about, you know, what happens um, after a shooting or even the before of a shooting, um, I think every single, every single shooting is really a policy failure. And I think the biggest policy failure in this country is poverty. There's no reason why we have folks that are houseless that are going to school without having, you know, a full healthy breakfast or going, going home hungry. There's, there's really no, there's no excuse for poverty in this country. So for me, that's, that's really the biggest root cause of gun violence. Hi, can every, uh, can everyone hear me? I'm, I'm I think I'm having a little trouble with my internet. Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, when we think about um, root causes, and uh, again, Tatiana has mentioned uh, poverty, but I think uh, also there's just, there are a lot of structural things that are happening um, in uh, in communities. Uh, when we, in, in, again, Tatiana has mentioned um, poverty, homelessness, uh, lack of social services. But uh, one thing we also need to think about is just conflict resolution. There are many. Uh, people who have conflicts and um, are searching for ways to to solve those. So that is that that is another um, root cause. Um, I also think that we we really can't have this conversation if we don't talk about um, uh, if we don't talk about. Uh, drugs, but it's not the use of drugs or the, not necessarily, but it's the fact that um, we, the, we don't have the regulation um, that, that we need. And so that causes uh, violence um, as, as well. Uh, so if we decriminalize some of these um, things and uh, we, could, we could possibly see less, uh, less violence. And, and finally, <laughs> I'll actually mention that, um, and I know that we're gonna get into discussions about uh, police uh, police reform, but um, I, I am a former prosecutor. I do believe that we need to have um, relationships, positive, healthy relationships with um, law enforcement in our communities. And unfortunately, some of the, um, the violence that we see from police officers is actually impeding the building of those relationships. So when we have uh, gun violence, something that happens in our communities, um, we, we need to find out who perpetrated that. We need to make sure that, that person doesn't do it again. We need to um, make sure that we know who that person is and so that we can do a, a review of the, the folks around them. Because another thing we know is that if you are a victim of gun violence or you have or you perpetrate gun violence, then those in your, your, your sphere, those closest to you can also be um, at risk. So when we have that deficit of information we're, we're really, um, we're, we don't have everything that we need, uh, all the tools that we need to combat um, uh, violence in our communities. So having stronger relationships uh, with law enforcement to help investigate um, those and, and bring to, uh, folks to justice um, is imperative. But again, we, it's very difficult to do that when we don't have um, those strong relationships that we need. Yeah, and just to echo that, uh, this is a systemic, uh, a systemic issue. Um, I think we have to look at the the history of our country um, and how it's rooted in uh, violence and the glorification of violence as a means to uh, to prosper and to get ahead. Um, and then combine that with the access to guns. Who has access to guns? Uh, why they have access to those uh, those weapons? Um, I think there's a lot of things we can look at. I, if we start just with the racist history of gun laws in America, we we struggle right to to pass just and what everybody feels like is equitable and fair gun reform in this country. Um, but that's often not the case when it's to control a minority population. So there are always three instances that I think of um, in the period immediately following slavery. Um, guns were made illegal for African Americans to possess um, as a as a control tactic. We don't want people who are newly freed to have access to to weapons to to further their their freedom and fight then against the people who recently were oppressing them. Um, in the 60s, when the Black Panthers' mission was to police the police, um, it be uh, 
or gun reform was then passed um, that said that made those actions illegal. Um, and so we see that uh, they, it depends who is holding the guns um, and what what those guns are being used for as as a means of like oppressing uh, people. And we think about causes of gun violence now. I just think about uh, the the amount of access to guns um, and the fact that there's more than one gun to every person in America, um, and we have like this some this this cultural like obsession with guns and firearms. And I think that also leads to a lot of the, the gun violence incidents that we see. Thank you. Um, yeah, if anyone, um, Tatiana, Cami, if you want to add on to what Alex said or go back to what one of you said previously, um, go ahead. And Cami, if you are okay sharing, I would love to hear more about um, conflict resolution. Yeah, so we know that there are times when uh, you can have, or, or there are programs, right, when, when folks talk about um, uh, violence disruptors, right? So people, you know, being able to, uh, you know, this, this goes back to when we're thinking about in our schools, right? And young folks and, and do, who, who are they talking to? Who, who can they talk to about the problems that are, are happening um, in their lives? And you know, uh, I, I can recall from my, my own life and my children's lives, um, you know, conflicts happen. But when you have, as some of the other panelists said, when you have um, an easy uh, access to, to firearms, I mean, this, these can, can escalate. And you have that, um, and I'm particularly thinking about youth violence, where we think about, we know that the adolescent brain, there, there's, there, it, tons of scientific studies and case law is, is even backs up these studies that um, we know that young people, um, they, they, they simply uh, through uh, actually their early 20s, right, um, don't necessarily uh, have the same uh, maturity um, physiologically uh, as adults. And so this, this combination of uh, the structural racism, poverty, uh, hope, hopelessness, violence, lack of conflict resolution, all of that going on in, in, in an ad, the adolescent uh, brain with the easy access to firearms and, and other means, it's just a really toxic uh, uh, combination. All right, thank you for expanding on that. Um, we're gonna move on to our next question. Uh, do you think law enforcement is a key partner when it comes to solutions? Why or why not? And Tatiana, if you would like to start, um, go ahead. Yeah, you know, I think it really needs to be in the hands of the community. Um, we should be the architects of what safety looks like and what that reimagining process looks like. Um, you know, I, both my parents actually, well, they're now retired, we're from MPD. Um, and my dad was actually a homicide detective. So he he's seen a lot of the gun violence in this community. But I do truly think it needs to be the hands of community members. They should be making the solutions. Um, when we when we talk about, you know, what does gun violence protection truly look like? And also, you know, our elected officials really need to do their part in making sure they're listening to community members. Cause I feel like we have these conversations all the time and we want funds to go to, you know, community-based organizations that are doing the work, but we never see that that money come through. So it's like, we it, we have to hold, you know, our elected officials accountable too, so. And so I, I would definitely wanna echo uh, what Tatiana said about it being in the hands of the community and community organizations being able to have uh, the power and the means to be able to inflict that uh, positive change on their communities. Um, I think that right now, as it stands, um, and the, the way that I'm gonna answer the question is the current state of what's going on in the country at the moment. Um, until, we, until people get things like uh, police reform um, and some groups are like fighting for, ab for abolition, um, until then, uh, it, I think it's important that those community organizations are at the table 
with law enforcement so that they're able to influence policy um, and things of that nature. I think that one of the most, the, one of the best experiences I've had as a neighborhood safety coordinator is actually going to MPD Citizen, Citizens Academy, um, where they teach you about how police officers are trained, um, what police procedures are, um, what the, the proper way to conduct certain police um, procedures is and what the incorrect way is. And I think that it's important for all community members to have that knowledge. And I think that there, it's not publicized enough, right? Like the, the information is public, what the code of conduct is and what all the police procedures are in certain situations. It's public, but it's not publicized. Um, and so people, if when once community organizations have that information um, and they're able to use that same language to then empower the community and fight the system of oppressive policing. I mean, get better if 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 they do want police uh, having community policing be the model that is um, expanded on and and actually utilized and is the the actual heart of what policing is. Um, until that happens, um, we do have uh, community organizations do. I feel like need that voice and need to be able to sit down with police officers, but also bring to the table. Um, that language. So I think the 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 biggest example for me is the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which put a ban on chokeholds um, being utilized against citizens. However, in a lot of the codes of conduct and a lot of the police procedures, there's no there's nothing in it that, that says chokehold. So while it feels like a victory for community organizations, um, it actually hasn't altered that those police procedures. And that's what I mean by having that language and having that knowledge to be able to, to create transformative, like actual sweeping change across those systems. Um, so until we get to the point where police presence isn't necessary, um, I think we do have to work with those organizations in order to create actual change in them. And, and I would just add, uh, echo the sentiments of, of, of both. Do you use? And they will say, see, so that you guys can, you guys can still hear me. Um, you actually cut out, so we weren't able to hear what you just said. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to turn my camera off for a second because I think that might help okay. my bandwidth. I apologize for my technical difficulties. Um, but I was just going to, again, echo both of those uh, sentiments. Um, and when I think about um, community, there's not a police chief in America that won't say uh, we are uh, implementing community policing. If you ask a, a police chief across the country, like what model of policing are you using? They're going to say community policing, but we know that that can't be the case. Um, as Tatiana said, the communities in a true model of community policing, it is the community that sets the priorities. You can never have, you should never have a policy or a practice that's implemented without community consent. And we've kind of gotten away from that. And when you think about, uh, well, who is the community? You know, is it voters? Because all the voters, right, in Milwaukee may not be uh, necessarily, uh, we know that all of Milwaukee is, and I'm just using that as this, that city as an example, because I'm looking at Tatiana's t-shirt, but like when you're just like looking at that city, um, we know that there are many different communities within that city, and they are not all policed in the same way. And that um, that is a, a problem. And I, I wanna go back to the um, George Floyd um, Policing Act because I do think that there are a lot of really valuable reforms uh, in the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. And these are, um, unfortunately, these are not new ideas, uh, ending racial profiling, um, limiting uh, chokeholds, limiting no-knock warrants, uh, all all of um, you know, creating a national registry of police misconduct. These are all ideas that we and you know have had in the uh, criminal justice reform uh, community for decades, right? But they just haven't been passed, and they still, even though this has passed the House, it has not passed the Senate, so it is not law. Um, and we need to make sure that that act can can pass uh, in the Senate, and we also need to. Um, 
pos and this is in, in my view, is that while I'm a very big fan of federal intervention when we need it, we really do have to look to our local communities because a lot of local communities have been able to get these um, certain types of these measures passed. Um, and they've done so very quickly. And again, when you're working at the local level, you can really ensure that these that that neighborhoods and communities that are touched by that type of police violence are the ones um, you know are, are where the change is occurring. Yeah, um, thank you. That is, um, yeah, it's definitely important to look towards um, more communities instead of stuff on a federal level, because while federal levels can help, um, having that community voice is also incredibly important. So um, if no one else has anything to add on to the, this question, um, we'll move on to the next one. Um, in your opinion, what role, if any, should police play within communities? Is it similar or different from what you see currently? And um, Cami or Alex, if one of you could start this time, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll just very briefly, because I think I've, I've said a, a lot of, um, you know, response to that, but I think that um, absolutely it has to be different than it is today. <laughs> We're not, you can look at the, the homicide uh, clearance rates uh, from uh, around the country and look at the, the zip codes and, and where they are and, and ask yourself what type of police uh, presence, what, what's happening um, in those communities. We've um, lived for decades under, you know, stop and frisk, right? Um, that's a, that's been a term that was used a lot in uh, for the practice that was happening in New York City, but it happens um, everywhere, lots of major metropolitan areas, black and brown um, young men indiscriminately stopped, frisked, and um, and the hit rate, what we call in law enforcement, the hit rate, um, just in terms of you know when you actually do find some type of, of contraband is really, really very, very low. So it's a very expensive practice in terms of the toll that it takes on the young men who are subjected to it. And it's not even an effective law enforcement tool. It's not even getting guns or drugs or things like that. Off, off of the street. So that that's one practice. But what we're seeing um, in many communities, police are uh, being an, an, an occupying force rather than a, uh, a guardians, right? And so I have a really um, good uh, friend uh, who has written uh, a lot uh, on this, uh, Seth Stoughton. You can check out his um, his his articles. But uh, we talk about this warrior mentality that that police officers. Have have when it, particularly when it comes to communities uh, of, of color. And having been um, a prosecutor uh, in Washington, D.C. many, many years ago, um, I could see, you could see the um, results when you look in, your, in, the, in the courtroom and every defendant that you see is a, is a black or brown male, um, you have to ask yourself, is there, is there not other crime happening in other districts um, is there not drug use? Is there not domestic violence um, happening in other areas of the city? And of course, of course there, uh, there was, of course there is. And um, it's just being uh, treated and policed differently. So when you have that ty those types of disparities, you're gonna get a lack of, of trust um, in our communities. And that is what's gonna re it really impedes the ability of law enforcement to work with communities to actually get guns off the off of of the street and out um, out of the hands of people who are not supposed to have. Yeah, and I think the uh, the question of what role should police play in communities. Um, I would love to live in a society where the even the thought of police is completely unnecessary, um, and I think that's about strengthening community organizations and social services to be able to take over those those uh, jobs or those roles um, that we rely on police officers for that uh, many times they don't have enough training for. Other people have gone to school to deal with um, certain things that they could see on the street that they shouldn't be dealing with. Um, so I think that we should always, no matter if we're in, uh, and I'm, this is to every, if we're working in a nonprofit role, if we're working in social services, if we're working in a service of any kind, our, our job should, our goal should always be 
to work ourselves out of a job always. And what I mean by that is we should, we should be so, because those organizations and those things exist because we have, we've identified a problem um, and we want to create something to fix it or a coalition to fix it or do something to help remedy the, so the problem. So eventually uh, we want to be able to say that this problem is fixed. There are no more jobs in uh, this social service work because this problem has been eliminated. Um, and I think we want to get to that point with uh, police in America is where the, uh, everything that they can do is handled by a community member, somebody from an organization or a social service who has uh, tra extensive training in it and has uh, healing and restorative justice at the heart of whatever that that practice is and whatever um, services people may need. So I, I, I definitely think that um, in in a perfect world, there is no police, there's no need for police, there's no need for uh, those kind of those law enforcement, um, ex the the idea of enforcement there's no idea for there's no place for enforcement um in our communities because they're thriving and because the community is taking care of itself and has the capacity to take care of itself yeah um so you know at march for our lives we've kind of came with these and these are like we didn't make these up but like these like five forces of gun violence right and we kind of spoke about them like poverty mental health crisis um, armed supremacy, political apathy, and gun glorification. And to me, police uphold these five forces. So I'm unable to see how they can be involved in solutions to gun, you know, solving gun violence, right? I mean, we even see, and we know this, police don't stop crime, they don't stop violence. Um, I even think about when I was in high school, like, as simple as like, yeah, I definitely cheated on tests before, even though I knew the consequences, but there was a need for me, right? I was at cheer practice. I was up late. I didn't study. So I cheated on a test or something like that. And I like, you know, so like and even on, a, on a micro level, like I, I I don't think it I don't think the answer to solving gun violence is law enforcement. Um, I think it really is community care and and making sure that all of our needs are met and that we're really just looking after each other and taking care of each other and pretty much echoing what Alex has said already. So Yeah, um, thank you. That was very insightful. Um, if we are ready, we'll move on to the next question. Um, how do you feel about defunding slash diverting police funds to other um, sources such as schools, um, more mental health um, options for people who are struggling? Um, and whoever wants to start, go ahead. Well, uh, I'll start, um, and I'll and I'll be um, very uh, honest here. When I when I hear, um, I understand um, when folks, given everything that our country that we've we've gone through, not just for the past few decades, but for centuries. And Alex mentioned, you know, our country is founded on you know racial violence and the precursors to modern police departments um, are. Uh, were slave <laughs> patrols, um, and they they regulated not only um, the movement of slaves but the movement of of free blacks. And then we can analogize even some of the practices used then. I mean, I mentioned stop and frisk, and that's very it's very much like what we see today. Folks, you know, walking, controlling um, the movement, asking you who you are, what are you doing, um, you know, uh, those kinds of things. So um, I hear that. Um, but I, I think I take a broader view when I think about crime um, in our society. And I would love uh, if we did not have a need for police officers or law enforcement um, or punishment. But when I see people like Ber Bernie Madoff, right, let's let's take it out of the the, the local uh, violence and think about the um, uh, all of the white collar crimes that that we see, right? Who's how are we how are we going to um, take care of that? When I look at the Capitol insurgents and folks that that beat um, other innocent people and beat you know just people who were in the Capitol trying to defend lawmakers, um, maimed them. When I think about that, uh, I don't know that I can say those people shouldn't be 
um, inc incapacitated for uh, a period of time or uh, something like that. So that doesn't mean in my mind that there's not, um, there's certainly, uh, we shouldn't be thinking about putting quote more boots on the ground. I don't like um, that term at all because we the officers we have we need to make sure that they are better trained. Um, we need to make sure we need to be very careful about who we're hiring. We need to be careful about asking them to do things that don't. An armed first responder does is is not should not be the first and only mental health call or you have um, a child who is literally we've seen five six-year-old children arrested in school those kinds of things don't need to happen um, and so we need uh, and we need to change our culture around things like that um, but to me um, I really um, I'm going to stop short of of this notion of, of defunding um, police and and because I also work with um, hate crimes um, and hate crimes against black and brown people and against um, trans and uh, trans uh, folks and uh, folks uh, different sexual orientations and um, and I've seen um, people you know murdered and beaten and, and raped and um, I believe that um, there is a role for law enforcement um, in in our country I think that it's not it, it shouldn't look how it looks today and I hope for a better uh, future um, uh, again, and and there's certainly transformative reform needs to happen. But in my lifetime, I'm not sure that I'm going to see some of those issues taken taken care of. And and we need some um, responses to to deter um, crime. That doesn't mean that we don't need to focus on the root causes. We absolutely do, and we have certainly have not been doing enough. Um, and sometimes law enforcement, oftentimes, most of the time, law enforcement tactics are directed unfairly against minority communities and in the harshest way. But if you look broadly, I can't, with a blanket statement, say that that um, that defunding um, is or abolishing. Um, so I think that I think there's space for um, money that is currently going towards law enforcement to be spent differently. Yes, um, and I think that the there's a the broader argument to be made about the percentage of the budget that police um, that police funds should go towards and law enforcement funds in general should go towards. Um, I do think. Uh, police departments should be demilitarized completely. There's no reason that police departments need um, tanks or military grade weapons. Um, if we need them, if we need military grade weapons, let's call them the military. Um, that's a whole nother conversation. Um, I think that budget money that goes towards the police can be spent towards creating a program where police officers um, actually have to complete a degree to be police officers. Um, if we're gonna keep uh, police officers um, in our society. Um, I think that there's space for an expansion of domestic violence advocates, uh, trauma response advocates, for youth workers, uh, for mental health services and agencies, um, for healing and restorative justice circles and restorative justice practices in general. I think that a lot of money can be diverted towards those things. Um, until we reach a point in our society where they're like we were talking about before where there's no need for uh, police officers in communities and over policing communities and stop and frisk and all these things that come with it. Um, but for I think there are things that can be done immediately um, and I think we have longer there are longer term goals in terms of uh, uh, defunding and abolition and things like that, but I'll stick with the that a lot of funds can be diverted into different programs and trainings and resources um, for people for community members from police funds. Yeah, so I um, I do one day want to see a world where police and prisons don't exist. You know, I do consider myself a student of abolition. I'm so thankful for folks like Marianne Caba, who, you know, writes these very well written books and it's really, you know, taught me so much and like, what does it really mean to reimagine public safety? Um, but I do think there's steps that we can take where we're not just like, oh my gosh, we're 
abolishing the police tomorrow, like, right, that's not going to happen. Um, you know, we have actually a campaign of March for Our Lives called Peace Out Police. Um, and really, it's the, a campaign on removing student resource officers or SROs from schools. And I think that's a really small step that we can take. You know, what are we telling kids when they go to school and they see an armed presence or they see a police officer? What does that say to us? What are we What are we telling our next generation of folks that we're that we're building up? Um, you know, I, I I I do I do think there's small incremental steps steps that we can take, and I think there's these ways that we can get involved that do you can I consider that is a way of divesting and investing into communities is going to school without seeing police presence. I think that's really, really important. When I went to high school, um, we were all actually the only high school that didn't have metal detectors every single day in NPS. We had them randomly. And like even still then that random check, I'm like, I'm just trying to get my education. Like, why am I going through a metal detector? Like what is what is happening? Like it's like makes no sense to me. But um yeah, I do think that we should defund the police. Um, I think another example of policing not working is, and I hate to bring up Chicago, but the mayor just brought in more funding in the policing. Um, and of course we're seeing, fortunately gun violence continuing an uptick, an uptick, an uptick. So I think it just continues to show that like this, this system, it doesn't work. Any system that's built on white supremacy has to go eventually, so. And really quick, if I could just jump in, I think that um, getting uh, school resource officers out of schools is actually a huge um, step just because of the overall nature, especially in, in Milwaukee and NPS of surveillance of students, of young people um, and how invasive that system is and how it's uh, a direct link to the school to prison pipeline. Like um, being told immediately upon your arrival that you cannot be trusted um, empty your backpack, walk through these metal detectors because we don't trust you as a community member. Somebody like Tatiana saying just wants to get their education um, and now you've made them feel like they are criminalized, right? And we've seen it as young as in middle school. We had, uh, when I was working at a Barack Obama School of Career and Technical Education, we had fifth graders going through metal detectors and just like the psychological toll that that takes. Um, so imagine if that kid goes to that school all through high school, that's seven, seven, eight years out of their life where they feel like they've been a, a criminal in a school building. Um, and we have to like to break those cycles. Um, and just thinking about even just, uh, I know surveillance cameras are there for uh, safety, but even the presence of those can sometimes feel like, you know, I'm always being watched, I can't be trusted. Um, and just to, to come, we need to separate um, punitive justice from our education system. Um, and schools that are saying that, I just know it's a little bit of a tangent, but schools that are saying that we invest in restorative practices, you cannot have a punishment on top of restorative practices. So if you're saying that we are, we're against school resource officers, we're against, you know, we have a 100% anti-bullying policy, all these things like, um, the second you suspend a kid, that's a punitive punishment. If they're out of the, they're, they're being told you have to be separated from your peers. It's equivalent to putting a kid who's too young to understand in timeout. Um, and I think that we we have to look at just our, our culture of punishment and of law enforcement and of like school rule enforcement and how, how it aligns to the, the oppressive nature of, of policing at times. Um, so I know that's a little bit off uh, what we were talking about, but I just want to hop in on the school resource officer thing. I think it's, that's a huge step towards um, more equity in, in, in our country. Yeah, and I, I want to um, reiterate uh, what uh, Tatiana and Alex have said. School uh, police officers have no role uh, in, in schools. School resource officers need to be out of schools. There's also no empirical data that shows that they're having an effect uh, on gun violence uh, in schools. And so they shouldn't be there. And they themselves are armed in the schools that if, if in, in some locations that that doesn't make any sense so definitely school resources out of uh, resource officers out of schools and um and i would also say that um that we should not have um police officers doing uh traffic stops i the, it, where i am in north carolina we have a lot of data on uh, black and brown people being stopped um, more often than, um, than than their white counterparts. And not only are they stopped more, they're searched more, they're arrested more for the same uh, offenses. Um, and so 
Um, again, just the whole like traffic uh, in interdiction, you don't need an armed first responder for that. We, we do have, and I, I, I am concerned about the surveillance state <laughs> that, we, that we live in, but since we live in the surveillance state, use that. You can, you can send somebody a ticket uh, in, in the mail. You do not have to stop their car and pull them out and pull them over. And that, that's um, not safe all the time for officers uh, either, right? But if you're pulling somebody over for a traffic, a, a traffic stop, there's really no technology that doesn't help uh, take, take care of even that. So we have to be very careful about technology, but since we have it, let's use it and let's not put uh, people in contact where they don't need to be in contact and these um, end up in these various dangerous uh, situations. And the other last quick thing I would say about when we think about the role of, of police, we have to go back to, and so I teach criminal law um, and we have to go back to the substantive criminal law. We have so many things that um, it, it, an officer cannot lawfully approach you unless there's reasonable suspicion that you are um, breaking, uh, breaking the law. And we have so many laws there's so much activity that's, that's taken up there. So we really have to look at the substantive criminal law and walk back of those violations. And that's where I was kind of going with the, um, you know, de decriminalizing certain substances and all, all kinds of things um, that, that are wrapped up in law enforcement that, that don't have to be. And if you take out a big chunk of that um, legal uh, hook that allows the officers to stop you, then you, you'll have, um, I think, can begin to rebalance um, our um, our society. Um, yeah, thank you all for your answers. Um, we're gonna move on. Uh, what major events have led to the way we have led to the way that we currently view police. Um, so I'm curious to hear all of your perspectives, really, if you have one. Um, Tatiana, I'm curious as to um, what you um, are aware of as you are also a young person like me. So I'm curious to kind of see your perspective on things, but also Cami and Alex, I'm curious to hear what you have to say too. Yeah, you know, I, I also think it's a little bit different for me because both of my parents, you know, were law enforcement. So like I grew up with guns in my house. I grew up with, you know, two black, two black parents that are also, you know, in this system of policing. So I, I think I have a little bit of an interesting perspective on it. Um, but of course, even like when I was growing up, I got like the talk and like what to do when you get pulled over and like to be wary of police and and you know, be cautious and make sure that, you know all these things that like, you know, so many black and brown folks get this discussion like growing up. So I think also the increase, and I think especially for us because we're, we're young and we grew up in this age of social media, like we can't turn away. It's really hard to turn away when we see these videos of police violence and police brutality. Um, like I Like for me, especially last summer, it was really hard for me to just like look away. I mean, it's just like right there, like, on our Instagram feeds, on our Twitter feeds, on Facebook, like it, it's just it's just like everywhere. So I think that also has has really had an impact. Um, I think just on us just growing up and and, and seeing that on social media. Um, I remember when I was like very young, I think like maybe 12, 13, it just it still like stuck with me. It was a it was a young girl at school and was like getting arrested in her classroom. And it was just like very, it was like very harsh. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, like this is this is like ridiculous, makes no sense for this to be happening to a girl that's like my age, but my size was just like, even just seeing that and growing up with that and seeing that on social media, it's like, I, I just wanna see like pictures of my friends. I wanna look up, you know, cute dog videos and I'm seeing like police brutality and police violence. And so I think that's also has really altered and that's probably a little bit different than other generations. Well, what I think is, so it's interesting for, again, a personal, I appreciate your, the personal story that Tatiana gave. So I'll give a bit of a personal story and that is, and it's going to date me since, since Jasper already said, call me old, <laughs> so this will, will date, it will date me even, even more. Uh, just kidding there, Jasper. But um, the, uh, I was a senior, a junior in high school when I saw Rodney King pulled out of a 
uh, car and beaten by um, the Los Angeles Police Department. And if any of you have had an opportunity to view that, you'll see that not only was he beaten by a beaten, kicked, hit by those uh, four officers, again, during a traffic stop, um, but uh, there uh, many other law enforcement uh, agents responded and they just stood there. They saw that happening, they knew it was wrong and they just stood stood there. So when you fast forward to what we saw with George Floyd and Derek Chauvin, uh, his knee on George Floyd's neck and those other officers, um, that really, really resonated with me. And before, you know, that's my generation's story, but before my generation, there were other generations, you know, folks had all these stories and, and every generation continues to have their uh, you know, uh, Rodney King, Timothy Thomas, uh, Sandra Bland, Eric Garner, we can name, there are too many to name. And so um, I think the current state has really just been a constant state. We're seeing this and we are just really are past um, the, the tipping point and saying enough is, is, is enough. And, and I the, will end with just saying that there, um, another thing I think that, that, uh, how we're viewing this differently is because when we look at the, if you look at the war on drugs, right, in the 70s and 80s, and really the war on drugs used to justify a lot of these aggressive police tactics, we didn't see that same level of police violence when it came to the opioid crisis. So we know you can do it differently. And that's not to say that we should see that during the opioid crisis. I'm saying, well, you, you have a solution. You saw the solution. Again, I mentioned the capital uh, insurgency. You saw a, an incredible amount of police restraint. So we know you can do it. And that's why, um, that is why uh, we are, I think, in our country feeling the way we feel. We know you can do it when you have a choice and you're just not choosing that restraint when it comes to black and brown communities and people. And their yeah, and I think uh, it's nothing, nothing is new. Right, it's just become more exposed, it's become more televised, more publicized, more accessible to watch um, instances of police misconduct and police brutality. Because um, uh, Kimmy spoke to it earlier, the the inception of policing in America is founded on slave catching um, and uh, and policing free black people uh, in the north, and that culture. Uh, has permeated its way through and is still um, at the heart of the the misconduct and the the officers who um, choose to color outside of the the lines. Um, and so when we think about I, I think for me personally, the the incidents that tug at my heartstrings the most are that of Mike Brown um, because I think that story resonates with me just because he was on his way to college um, and he was, there was no reason that, that that incident had to turn violent, right? And because of his perceived criminality, um, because of his size, because of his race, because of all these historical um, injustices and oppressive things that have led to that moment, um, a young man with a bright future lost his life. Um, and I think that combined with, I remember being in college when um, George Zimmerman was on trial for Trayvon Martin. And as soon as the first the first count came back not guilty, I remember being so upset that I, that I turned the TV off um, and had a roommate at the time who, who um, expressed disappointment that I turned the TV off because he wanted to watch it. Um, and it wasn't, it, it, at that point I realized that for for some people, um, this is entertainment, right? And it's and CNN is is their ESPN or like or, or their their E or their it's their form of entertainment, and it's it's difficult when um, it easily could have been you. Um, I've been I've been pulled over before in situations where there was nothing I've done wrong, and the only questions were, "What are you doing over here? What are you doing? What are you doing over here?" Um, and so that's not lost on me. Um, and so when I think about 
uh, young men who have, have unfortunately lost their lives um, combined with the racist history of policing. I think that all those things account for um, people's justified view of however they feel about the state of policing in America. Um, yeah, thank you, Tatiana and Cami, for sharing your personal stories, and then um, Alex for that story too. Um, it definitely is hard seeing that some people view this type of stuff as entertainment um, because I'm I'm white, so I don't I can't exactly relate fully to most of the cases we hear about. But when it comes to um, stuff like trans violence, it's definitely hard for me and I have to take um take a step away just to um let myself breathe for a minute and the fact that some people find these kinds of things entertaining it's it's really hard to um process yeah so um unless Cami I saw you on mute go ahead <laughs> I, I was just gonna say that um, I and I, I told the, the organizers that unfortunately I have to hop off just a, a little bit early, so I'm gonna stay here and then I will uh, drop off when I when I need to. But I, I was gonna say that um, in, you bring up the point of the, you know the the violence that we've seen against um, all types of underrepresented people, you know, is 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 unacceptable and. Um, and I think when we think about the violence against trans people, that is a, that is another frontier that we really have failed to um, to to address. And so I just wanted to name that. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, but as I was saying, unless anyone has anything else to add, um, let's move on to the next question. Um, what comes to mind immediately after hearing about a police shooting incident? And Alex, I'm curious to hear your perspective um, because of your role and how you, um, because of your role in the community. Yeah, I think my uh, my reaction has shifted um, since I've since I've gotten this role. I think that before um, police shootings and things of that nature were um, as much as they were personal, they were always one step away, right? They were like one step removed from my actual reality. Um, fortunately, I've, I've been, I've never um, personally been shot at. I've never been shot. Um, I haven't lost anybody in my life close to me because of gun violence, and I'm, I'm fortunate in, in that regard. Um, but I think that being in this role as a neighborhood safety coordinator, um, you when you hear about things, um, it becomes more personal. Um, it becomes, uh, I wonder, is this resident okay? Um, or if, if there were bullets like shot through a house, I hope there were no kids at home. Um, and you think about all, I think about all the, like the different components of what a what happens after a shooting um, and the, the, the trauma that's associated with it. The people who are witnesses, um, if they, if people need therapy, if they need healing, if they need um, other kind of services, um, and I think that before, I, I looked at it more as just like I was sad for the city, right? And I was just like, um, it, these incidents, um, it's sad, it's unfortunate that these happen um, when it's it's upsetting, right? And and now it's more, I look at it as, what can I do? Um, to help make the situation better. If there was a kid who was a witness, how can I get them in touch with the trauma response team to help get them social services? Or if they need uh, a therapist, or if the shooting incident happened because of a domestic violence incident, um, get, connecting people with, uh, with resources to help combat that. Um, so I think that I've, I've shifted more from, from a visceral like emotional reaction to more of a a technical and like, how can I help um, reaction when it comes to when it, whether it's a, a citizen shooting or a police shooting. Um, that's that's kind of how my mentality has shifted since since I've taken on my role as a neighborhood safety coordinator. And and I'll just add before I go, I'll just say that um, 
you know, everything um, that, that Alex said, you know, your heart goes out for, you know, for the, 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 the victim of the, the shooting, the family, the, co the entire community, because these things reverberate, right, throughout the, the community. It's not just another, you know, um, person, but we can't help but thinking like that could be, that could be my son, that could be my cousin, that could be my uncle, that could be me, those, those types of things. But the other uh, thought that I have is that I, I worry that we're becoming desensitized, that our society could be coming desensitized. And you see that when, uh, and it's resonant in some of the things that you all talked about in terms of people thinking that this is entertainment, right? No, this is like, I mean, and, and also too, I've served as like an expert witness in cases and um, have you know been close to some of these uh, issues. And, um, and I teach the, these uses of force in class and it's like the imagery of this is not entertainment. This is often, this is the last, lot, the last moments of someone's life. And uh, we really have to, in some ways, you know, you want people to, 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 un, to be able to understand the, 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 the outrage and the, you know, the calls for reform. It's, it, 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 people have to sometimes be a witness to that because otherwise they, they, can't, they can't process it. And so it's changed, but at the very same time, it's just, how did we get here? Why, why can't you just understand the sanctity of life? Why can't you understand the sanctity of life without having to see it um, over and over and over again? And so that bothers me, it worries me that, that these images um, are out there and what it's doing to a whole other generation of kids. Yeah, I think the biggest thing I'll, I'll add is because um, I work with, you know, a lot of survivors and, and young people have been impacted by gun violence. Um, I've been seeing amongst my peers, my friends, that when there's a shooting that happens, um, it's often re-triggering. And I can also speak for myself, especially when it's domestic violence related or police related. Um, it's, it's almost like re-triggering. So something that I've been really big on is trying to like, curate more safe spaces for us to just come and talk whether it's mostly it's been virtual because like we live everywhere but like just having a safe space for us to like just come together and and speak and yell or cry like whatever that needs to be um yeah because also even just like protesting and organizing protesting that in itself is exhausting and can be traumatizing in the experiences that you experience with you know whether it's like supremacists or police like it's just it's so much so just really like big on like taking care of like my community and, and of course myself yeah that's um it's definitely important to have those um safe spaces where people can just um cry or um vent if they have to about what they um are dealing with just from either hearing the news or protesting or um what have you. Um, we had another question, but we are getting close to, to time. And um, we did talk about this briefly, but um, could you leave us with your final thoughts about the future of public safety? Yeah, I'll be quick. Um, I think it's really up to all of us. I don't, you know, um, we, we need to be the architects of what that looks like. We, you know, just have to come together and really just decide what that looks like and I think especially it's in the hands of those directly impacted the most impacted the most affected so yeah yeah and I think uh coming back full circle to uh, Tatiana's first amazing point about um gun violence being an issue of poverty um gun violence and violence in general has been declared a public health crisis right so we know that there are um deep-rooted systemic issues as to why violence occurs in communities. Um, when people don't have the things that they need, they often turn to um, illegal ways of getting what they need to survive. Um, it's human nature to want it to, to survive. Um, and however people are able to do that, oftentimes, or not, I won't say oftentimes, but there are times when people um, get hurt because of it and the access to guns and the the glorification and all those things of guns contribute to those those factors. I say all this to say, um, if we want to combat uh, gun violence in our communities, we have to look at 
uh, how we take care of the people within our communities. Um, is there good access to education, to job opportunities, to food, to health care, to mental health resources, to therapy for people who need it? Um, when people have all the things that they need, the 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 capacity for crime will will plummet significantly. Um, and there is there there may always be a small faction of people who who want to operate outside of um, what it means, what it, what everybody feels like they need to be safe within society. Um, but then that becomes a community issue, and it it doesn't have to be a law enforcement issue. Um, we enter into a, a social contract with our our communities when we live in them, and we need to start taking care of our communities, ourselves, and each other, and ensuring that everybody has what they need to be successful and productive, and to live a happy and healthy life, and not feel like they have to pick up a gun or use a gun to to survive. Yeah, um, thank you so much for um, being here on this panel and sharing your opinions. Um, Tatiana, Alex, and Cami, although she had to leave a bit early. Um, thank you. This was, I'm glad you were all able to um, be here and share your insight on these topics. Yeah, thank you and thank Wave for inviting me. This has been, this has been a great experience.